मलेरिया This talk, uh, talk will be given by Dr. V. K. Vini. The chair persons for uh, today's session are Dr. Roshan M. Yes, he is the professor and the head of the department of uh, Department of Medicine, Pathologist, uh, Medical College Hospital, Mangalore, and uh, Dr. Balachandra E. Shetty. He is the professor and the chair of Department of Medicine, Medical Institute of Medical Sciences, Mangalore. Uh, today's uh, C. I will welcome all of you to the C. M. Sir. Today's chief guest and the uh, inauguration for today's CME will be done by uh, Professor Dr. B. S. K. Rao sir. I welcome you to the gathering, sir. I also welcome my co-moderator Dr. Akshana Bhatt and all the other guests who have uh, joined uh, the webinar on time and showed such an overwhelming response. Thank you all. And uh, now I request uh, uh, Dr. B. S. K. Rao sir to kindly. Uh, do a virtual inauguration of this year good afternoon after all ap members who are online i am gl uh, glad that uh, this cm is being uh, conducted the rightfully in the season of uh, malaria and dengue i am also glad because i am uh, Uh, this is an area of interest for me for the last 15-20 years. Malaria insurgency started in 1995 in Mangalore, and uh, I had uh, uh, active role in both the management and prevention and uh, the research for 15-20 years in Mangalore. In 1995, we started getting severe malaria suddenly, and we are not prepared. Both the uh, Health department and doctors, but drugs were very few. Since then, we are able to control. Luckily, for the last uh, uh, few years, there, there is a decline in the uh, malaria, and uh, the the recent statistics uh, uh, shows that uh, malaria is on the decline in Mangalore. In Karnataka itself, 2018 only 5,229 cases were reported. In 2020, only 913 cases. In Mangalore, 2019, 4,041 cases were reported. In 2022, only 689, and 2023 uh, up to April, only 18 cases are reported as per the health authorities' statistics. Uh, in this connection, I would like to draw the history of uh, malaria for one sentence. Mr. Ronald Ross was responsible for describing the malaria uh, cycle, life cycle in the mosquitoes, and uh, he worked in uh, Madras, Bombay, Secunderabad, Calcutta. There is an anecdotal history that for a brief period he was also in Venla Hospital. I have no evidence to say anything more than that, but uh, he worked in Bangalore, uh, Secunderabad, where he described it. But our main research was. In Calcutta, in the bird malaria, parasites were found in bird malaria. And uh, regarding the dengue, dengue also started more or less same time in Mangalore, and the number of cases after the last two three years, the case of dengue have come down. Two thousand nineteen, one thousand five nineteen thirty nine cases were reported. In 2022, only 380 cases were reported in uh, Mangalore. The interestingly, the malaria parasites. I mean, uh, not malaria. Uh, the dengue virus was uh, 
discovered by two Japanese scientists, one Ren Tomura and uh, uh, Somo, uh, both in 1943 during an epidemic in Japan, uh, Nagasaki. So I wish all the best for the the CME and also the Levis Reserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for inaugurating the CME. Uh, at KPI Dakshina Kana chapter from uh, this uh, studio in Mangalore, we are extremely excited to see this overwhelming response to the CME. I thank all the members who have joined from all parts of Karnataka. I can see Dr. Nagesh Kalinali, uh, Vice President of uh, uh, IFA Karnataka chapter, having joined from there. Welcome to all the members. And uh, before we proceed, uh, some uh, quick updates. I request all the attendees to please keep their mic on mute so that uh, the speakers can present without any disturbance. And uh, if there are any questions during the uh, during the presentation, I request you all to kindly type those questions in the Q&A or Q&A box so that we can take those questions in the end. Also, uh, towards the end, we will have uh, uh, an opportunity for unmuting ourselves and uh, getting involved in the discussion and question and answers. So, without uh, wasting much time, I would like to now hand it over to the chairpersons for uh, uh, conducting this uh, CME and taking it further. I think Dr. Uh, VHT is uh, like, sir, over to you, sir. Hello. Hello, I'm audible. Yes, Hello. Sir. Yes, yes. Audible. Yeah, yes, good afternoon. First of all, thanks to the, our APA chapter to conducting such a very informative CME. So, about the infectious disease. The first speaker is Professor Chakrabhani, sir, Professor of Medicine from KMC Bangalore. So, he has many publications for his studies. So, he'll be speaking on evaluation and management of dengue fever, mainly the guidance. So, one of the experienced teachers, teacher from KMC. So, especially this is important for the postgraduates. Now, the, the PGs who joined from 2021 onwards. So, there is an importance to the, all the infectious disease. The 100 marks, one of the paper is only for infectious disease for the PGs who joining after 21. So, PGs can read from the textbook, but after listening from an experienced teacher, if you read once again, it will be a very much informative. So, I will request Chakrapani sir to proceed with the talk. Good afternoon, respected chairpersons, moderators. When we talk about dengue fever, we talk, think about Good afternoon, respected chairpersons, moderators. Good afternoon, respected chairpersons, moderators, members of APA, residents and practicing doctors. Monsoon brings lot of miseries along with that including vector bone diseases. Dengue has been one of such diseases and we have got nice guidelines from WHO and also government of India for management of uh, dengue fever. These are excellent guidelines based on a lot of evidence and today I will be taking you through the scientific basis for these guidelines and also add a few of our thoughts based on our own studies in the field of dengue fever. When we talk about dengue fever, we talk, think about platelets. 
We also note that the pathogenesis involves a combination of vasculopathy and platelets. But the current narrative is that vasculopathy is a small event in the dengue fever and we all focus on platelet and thrombocytopenia as a major pathogenetic event and our focus of treatment is often on platelets whether it is the patients, patients relatives, doctors, politicians or media persons all of them look into platelet count only while managing patients thinking that that is the therapeutic target. Unfortunately, this is only Ardha Satya. When you cover the, uh, when you uncover the uh, true picture, the truth emerges. The truth is that although vasculopathy and platelets are two important ma manifestations of dengue fever, the role of thrombocytopenia is very much limited in terms of uh, pathogenesis into severe dengue fever. It produces only mucosal bleed and nothing beyond that. It is the vasculopathy that is most important for management of dengue patients or producing complications. The initial damage to the endothelium is in the form of functional change leading to excessive capillary leak which can manifest as hypotension or compartment syndrome or abdomyolysis because of excessive compartment syndrome or when there is significant endothelial damage can manifest as DIC resulting in visceral bleed and organ ischemia. In addition to that, of late we have realized that there is an, another element of uh, to this pathogenetic mechanism in the form of cytokine storm or excessive inflammatory response because of the poor host immunity and all three of these complications, all three pillars, hypotension due to capillary leak, visceral bleed because of DAC and cellular damage due, due to inflammatory cascade will produce shock, bleeding and organ involvement because of the various combinations of these events which result from hypovolemia, ischemia and inflammatory changes. Platelets only produce minor mucosal bleeds, nothing beyond that. If we have to reduce mortality due to dengue, we have to study people who have died because of dengue, not focusing on those who have survived uh, uh, the dengue episode. So we need to find out the mechanism by which they die. We need to find out the biomarkers or predictors of this mortality and we also have to find out the exact pathogenetic mechanism whether it is because of coagulopathy, whether it is because of DAC, whether it is because of inflammation or because of thrombocytopenia. We need to find out what exactly produces complications in dengue patients and only then we will be able to prevent them. One such good study was published in uh, 2022 in Journal of Microbiology and Immunology and Infections. 60 deaths were identified in uh, uh, around 4,500 dengue patients and in this paper they studied in de detail the, de uh, the cause of death uh, uh, of these patients. 40 patients died within the one, first one week and 20 died in the second week or subsequently. And interestingly only 28 out of 60 patients died of typical dengue complications of shock, DAC or organ failure. Please note that thrombocytopenia was not the cause of death. It was a shock due to work, capillary leak or DAC uh, due to vasculopathy or organ, organ failure because of the combination of the two but not thrombocytopenia uh, in this patient. So less than half of them uh, had typical dengue death due to uh, shock, DAC or organ failure. More than about uh, uh, 29 patients had other causes and nearly 24 of them had secondary infection. This is very important because uh, many of our patients may be dying uh, uh, because of second infection. They may survive the dengue onslaught but succumb to secondary infections and others may die because of organ involvement due to inflammatory changes. So it is not just the thrombocytopenia, it is the typical dengue complications or secondary infections or inflammation induced organ failures that give rise to death in these patients. 13 uh, cardiac deaths were there and interestingly five of them did not have thrombocytopenia. So even without thrombocytopenia there could be cardiac arrest in patients with dengue fever. Eight of these uh, 13 cardiac arrests uh, were inside the hospital and only two were in class C that is severe dengue and five of them were in class B that was those with dengue and warning symptoms and one patient had cardiac arrest in spite of not having any other complication and he was in class A. So 
dengue deaths can occur even without the classical thrombocytopenia and even those patients who are not going into severe uh, dengue fever the moment there is a warning symptom we should be careful uh, about these patients there was an interesting meta analysis of mortality due to dengue patients which was published in the year 2022 and in this study uh, 220 deaths due to dengue fever were analyzed in a meta analysis and uh, uh, systematic review it was found that severe hepatitis shock syndrome altered mentation diabetes and tachycardia were the predictors of mortality in this patient with the high odds ratio severe hepatitis had odds ratio of about about 30 and shock syndrome had odds ratio of about 23.6 for mortality when in patients with dengue fever interestingly thrombocytopenia did not figure in the list of markers of mortality so we have enough evidence to say that platelets or thrombocytopenia is not a marker of complication not a therapeutic target and does not tell us anything Uh, uh any meaningful uh, uh, inference in patients with uh, dengue fever patients with dengue fever go through a uh, uh, series of changes initially they are in the febrile phase and after about 5 or 6 days they get into the critical phase and thereafter they go to recovery phase in the initial febrile phase the dengue ns1 will be positive and by the time they get into critical phase the dengue ns1 will become negative and slowly the igm antibody will start building up and after about 7 or 8 days igm antibody will become positive fever will be uh, seen very clearly in the stage 1 and uh, they have fever myalgia and uh, headache vomiting hematocrit will be normal initially platelets will be normal initially but as we enter into the second phase of critical phase that's when sudden changes will occur in the patient's uh, uh, clinical features and pathogenic features the temperature will come uh, to normal level in fact it may become sub uh, 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 less than normal levels there will be significant capillary leak in the critical phase resulting in a sudden elevation of sudden and dramatic elevation of hematocrit and of course we'll be seeing thrombocytopenia also because of the capillary leak we will be seeing good amount of uh, fluid into the visceral spaces in the form of pleural effusion or ascites after this critical phase patients will uh, go into recovery phase and and during this phase all the fluid which went into the interstitial interstitial space will come back into the intravascular space and if the fluid is not regulated in this uh, uh, during this phase there can be severe pulmonary edema so in the critical phase there is going to be sudden but dramatic hypovolemia but in the recovery phase there is going to be redistribution and all that fluid will come back to the intravascular space resulting in a possible pulmonary edema if the fluid administration is not stopped the capillary leak which occurs in the critical phase is quite dramatic and rapid and the recovery is also quite dramatic and rapid and whole or the entire uh, uh, capillary leak phase lasts for about just about 24 to 48 hours so this feature this uh, uh, critical phase is only seen for about uh, one or two days and after that the recovery phase starts and fluid should not be continued in an aggressive manner beyond this stage because of the risk of redistribution pulmonary edema uh, in the recovery phase the uh, dengue definitions have changed in 2009 uh, who redefined the dengue stages uh, and uh, it is called as dengue fever dengue with warning symptom and severe dengue and we don't use the term dengue hemorrhagic fever uh, uh, anymore the initial phase of dengue fever without any complications is called as dengue fever without warning symptoms and this is the stage where patient can be managed in the outpatient setting when they develop warning symptoms that is the stage where patient need to be uh, observed very closely and they have to be admitted to the hospital maybe in the secondary care, uh, uh, care center but once they develop severe dengue either with the compensated shock or decompensated shock or with the organ involvement they have to manage in a tertiary care center because they require very close monitoring uh, to prevent complications in group a 
they can be managed in the OPD with the, the, with the antipyretics, analgesics and uh, good amount of uh, oral dehydration. In group B where they develop warning symptoms they have to be watched very carefully and should be admitted to the hospital and group C are the patients where aggressive monitoring and treatment is required. These are the warning symptoms which have been uh, defined by WHO, abdominal pain, vomiting, bleeding, severe fatigue or weakness, Organomegaly like hepatomegaly and splenomegaly, rise in hematocrit and thrombocytopenia, and fluid into the visceral spaces like pleural effusion and ascites. Please note that thrombocytopenia alone is not a warning symptom or a sign. Only when it is associated with rise in hematocrit, it becomes a warning symptom or sign. So here again, WHO has very clearly defined that looking into platelet alone is not sufficient look into the hematocrit and thrombocytopenia together and that will be one of the important warning signs that should be looked for while managing these patients. So when they are in the stage A and when they are entering into defervation stage that is the time we should be watching very closely for these symptoms and any patient with one of these warning symptoms should be referred to the uh, center where they can be watched and monitored very closely. Severe dengue is not just thrombocytopenia, it goes much beyond platelets and hemorrhages, combination of vasculopathy, coagulopathy, cytokine storm and secondary infection. These are the three verticals that are important uh, in deciding the outcome of severe dengue. Vasculopathy and coagulopathy in the form of DIC, cytokine storm which can result in a severe inflammatory change, secondary infection which can give rise to septic shock phase. Can we differentiate these phases clinically? Vasculopathy is manifested initial phase around fifth day with this profound hypovolemia and significant partial hypotension and hemoconcentration. Cytokine phase is uh, usually seen after five or seven days. Hypovolemia may not be profound, partial hypotension may not be profound, hemoconcentration may or may not be seen. That is why we differentiate clinically the vasculopathic stage that is capillary stage from inflammatory cytokine stage. The fluid requirement in uh, dengue shock is dramatic. The requirement suddenly surges upwards from uh, the baseline level of about 100 ml per hour to about 400 to 500 ml per hour within the span of around 12 to 24 hours. But it is not sustained. Within the next 24 hours, the requirement has come down to the basal level. So the 24 to 48 hours are very cr critical where there will be rapid change in the requirement of fluids hour to hour there can hour to hour there can be difference in the requirement hence they require very close monitoring and what we need is not expensive uh, test for monitoring patients what we require is trained healthcare persons who can sit beside the patient and watch for clinical signs of fluid requirement and adjust the rate of uh, the fluids according to the needs of the patients we need to monitor hematocrit and hemodynamics if the hematocrit is increasing and hemodynamics are worsening that means we need to increase the fluid administration some of them may require even colloids if the hematocrit is decreasing and hemodynamics are worsening this is the these are the patients who have internal bleed and may require blood if the hematocrit is decreasing and hemodynamics are improving then we need to reduce the fluids hemodynamics are blood pressure capillary refill time and urine output and overall well-being of the patient these are the parameters that we need to monitor while deciding about clinical improvement. So clinical improvement and hematocrit together decide our action whether it is going to be increasing the fluids or giving blood or reducing the fluids. Platelets are not transfused generally unless there is a major bleed. Uh, when the platelet count is less than 10,000, peripheral transfusions are generally not required except in high risk uh, patients who have got high risk for bleeding. These are the patients who have got high, very high blood pressure uh, before dengue or those for antiplatelet risk or pregnancy. In these conditions, when the platelet counts are less than 10,000, there is a role for prophylactic platelet transfusion. In a study published in Lancet in the year 2017, it was found that prophylactic platelet transfusion does not have any benefit for those who were not transfused platelets. Uh, patients were studied in two groups. The group which received uh, prophylactic platelet transfusion when the count was less than 20,000 and the other group which did not receive prophylactic platelet transfusion. 
each group had about 170 patients. There was no difference in the clinical outcome in these two groups, nor was the recovery of platelet different in these two groups. In fact, platelet recovery was slower in those who received platelet transfusion. There were 13 adverse events in the group which received transfusion, some of them were major uh, adverse events. So there is no benefit but only more complications when platelets are transfused. And in the subgroup analysis of those below 10,000 and 5,000 also showed that there was no difference in the overall clinical outcome. Platelets had higher uh, side effects like urticaria, anaphylactic shock, transfusion related acute lung injury, fluid overload or infections. The conclusion from this study was that the authors, uh, the, the uh, editorial uh, uh, came to the conclusion that taken together the evidence calls for prophylactic plate trans transfusion to be stopped in the management of adult dengue patients in at any level of uh, plate plates. Steroids also did not show any benefit uh, as per the Cochrane review either in the stage of uh, dengue shock or in the early stages. So there are three verticals as complications of dengue. One is capillary leak, other one is uh, inflammatory change, third one is infections. In a small study we found that soluble CD25 is a better marker of uh, inflammatory change that is HLH compared to uh, ferritin. Soluble CD25 had a 0.98 uh, correlation with the HLH score whereas ferritin had only 0.51 uh, correlation. Soluble C25 was 100% sensitive and 100% specific for identifying uh, HLH in patients with dengue fever compared to just about 67% and 55% uh, uh, with ferritin. Soluble C25 could identify a subgroup of dengue patients who might benefit from immunosuppression like steroid, but this is still a theoretical uh, uh, argument. There is, uh, we do not have evidence to say that. Uh, steroids will work in this patient, but it stands to reason that those with high soluble CD25 and hence HLH could benefit from steroids. When do you suspect HLH? Persistence of fever beyond 5 days, presence of significant cytopenias in organomegaly like splenomegaly and if the blood cultures are sterile and if you are able to show that markers of uh, inflammation are high in the form of high CD25 or ferritin then you suspect uh, uh, HLH in patients with dengue fever. The, dengue fever. the other vertical uh, 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 with regard to complication is ca capillary leak, plasma leak syndrome and we found in uh, another study that a partial for systolic blood pressure was a very good marker of uh, capillary leak syndrome and partial for the blood pressure and presence of ascites were the two important warning signs which were quite reliable in uh, identifying the capillary leak and severe dengue patients and we used this uh, model uh, the decision tree analysis to come out with a flow chart to identify those who are likely to develop significant uh, capillary leak and uh, uh, com complications. We found that among 150 dengue patients if there was a fall of more than 10.33 percent in the systolic blood pressure on standing they remain much of complications uh, in spite of dengue fever. But if the fall is more than 10.33 percent uh, 10 and if they did not have pleural effusion there again they did not develop much of a complication. But if they had more than 10.33 percent fall and had effusions significant number of them developed uh, uh, severe dengue subsequently. And if the fall was more than 18 percent in the blood pressure many of them had complications and uh, uh, succumbed to the, uh, uh, their illness 3 out of 13 uh, such patients expired. So, Presence of partial fall in the blood pressure and presence of uh, effusions could be a simple clinical marker for identifying the important pathogenetic mechanism of capillary leak in patients with dengue syndrome. The inflammatory marker which is another important uh, vertical in the pathogenesis can also be identified by simple clinical markers. In another study involving 173 dengue patients we found that if there was no splenomegaly, there was hardly any HLH. If the patients had splenomegaly and then had uh, low WPC count and then had low uh, platelet count, these are the patients who had high possibility of developing HLH. So in resource limited uh, situations, we do not have to look for ferritin or other uh, clinical markers like uh, fibrinogen. Every patient with uh, uh, dengue fever, 
only when they had splenomegaly and low WBC and uh, low platelet we then have to go for evaluation of uh, uh, these expensive tests to identify HLH uh, uh, and then decide about The third vertical is the infections. The uh, patients with severe dengue develop variety of infections. In one small study uh, we found that during the span of two months there were 10,000 total hospital admissions with the 4, 471 dengue admissions. Those with dengue fever had a higher amount of dengue, uh, uh, staphylococcus uh, bacteremia compared to those who did not have dengue. The relative risk was 15.97 for those with dengue fever for development of staphylococcal bacteremia. <coughs> Patients with diabetes and uh, those who were receiving steroids were the ones who had high risk of developing staphylococcal bacteremia. These three verticals are shown here for the dengue complications. Vasculopathy it can be identified by falling the blood pressure and also uh, in, by hemoconcentration and they also will have higher amount of uh, DIC and they have to be uh, treated with a good amount of fluids and after giving fluids vasopressors may be required and they may require uh, uh, fresh frozen plasma with a significant coagulopathy to treat DIC. The second vertical is the inflammatory change, cytokine storm can be identified easily by looking for splenomegaly and uh, presence of cytopenias and they may require immunosuppression. Third vertical is the sepsis which can be identified by fever, leukocytosis and warm shock and they may require appropriate antibiotics and even some of them may require antifungals. WHO and the Indian governments have given uh, detailed guidelines and uh, I have tried to summarize that in a, a small chart which is shown in this uh, uh, PPT where various stages of dengue disease are uh, depicted here and the stages where we have to refer the patient that is those with warning symptoms have been explained here and also the requirement of fluids in different stages and clinical parameters that need to be monitored and the role of steroids and later transmissions are shown in this uh, uh, flow chart. In conclusion, we have looked at dengue as dengue thrombocytopenic fever and we have to unlearn this concept. Platelet is a messenger but not the message. The message is that there is significant amount of inflammation, there is significant amount of capillary leak, there is significant amount of coagulopathy in the form of DIC. So platelet is just a messenger but not a therapeutic target. There is no point in chasing the platelet count with various interventions. Warning signs like vomiting, abdominal pain and drowsiness, thrombocytopenia, uh, uh, elevation or fall in the blood pressure are the ones which decide the overall re referral pattern of these patients and uh, pa patients with the warning symptoms should be referred to a place where patients can be monitored very closely. We should differentiate between capillary leak, inflammation and septic processes and uh, organ involvement is very important in deciding the outcome. Cardiac involvement has to be uh, anticipated and uh, we have to do ECG for most of these patients who are getting, getting admitted. Plasma leak could be sudden, variable but short lived for about 48 hours. Close monitoring of clinical parameters are vital. Steroids may be helpful only in a small subset of patients and there again it is not for improving the improvement of platelet count, it is for overall mortality benefit in HLH like conditions. Clinical markers like postural hypotension can be a surrogate for a plasma leak and presence of splenomegaly and uh, cytopenias could be surrogate for uh, HLH like uh, manifestation and using these simple clinical parameters we can decide the treatment plan for patients with severe dengue uh, fever. Thank you very much. Good afternoon everyone. After listening to the project from my last study of medicine this season, we want a second talk by Dr. Vinit. Dr. Vinit is the British MBPS and MD from Shema and subsequently has done his FND infectious disease in Upper Hospital Chennai. Uh, he has several publications, more than 25 publications, and he has several awards at this uh, 
is short and applied in the very young dynamic infectious disease specialist on the NIMU. He will talk about the diagnosis and management of complicated and uncomplicated malaria. Over to Dr. Kamil. I thank uh, uh, APL, senior consultants, uh, my colleagues for giving me an opportunity to talk on diagnosis and management of malaria. Uh, before I go to the talk, basically humanity has three great enemies, fever, famine and war. Of these, by far the greatest and the most terrible is fever. It would be incomplete before I thank my teachers at Apollo Institute for during my super speciality, Dr. Ram Subramaniam, Dr. Ram Gopalakrishnan. And Dr. Abdul Ghafoor has been the student of Dr. Chakrapani. He is my teacher at Apollo uh, Hospital Chennai, Dr. Sendhu Nundi and Dr. Suresh Kumar for in cultivating an uh, enormous interest of infectious diseases during my super speciality training. I would uh, try to make it case scenario based for the interest of postgraduates. Uh, a 48 year old male, hypertensive, uh, presented with fever since 5 days, associated with chills, more in the evening, associated with headache, body pain, joint pain. He had two episodes of loose stools on the day of admission. No cough, abdominal pain. History of outside food was present almost daily. Exposure to water sources, there was loss of appetite, however, no loss of weight. Day fall of the illness, uh, he noticed high colored urine. That's why he came to us for a consent. After examination, boiled toxic, he had dry down. Pulse rate was 90, blood pressure was 122 by 80. No rashes, no ectus, no lymphadenopathy. Uh, systemic examination, he had liver and spleen palpable, no other localizing sign. So this may not be just malaria, you can put enormous differentials in it. I request uh, postgraduates to uh, put their differentials in the chat box. We will give them around the corner. So any differentials from your side? So this is an acute febrile illness. Okay, an acute febrile illness with liver and spleen palpable. Okay, DB. It's an acute febrile illness. So, whenever we uh, uh, come across a consult, a, a case, first we redefine the syndrome. This is an acute febrile illness, body pain, joint pain, liver and spleen palpable. Okay, we'll move ahead. Hemoglobin was 13.2, total count was 3590, uh, differentials of neurotropin 79, lymphocyte 16, monocytes 4, he had thrombocytopenia. So, more information platelet, there is thrombocytopenia, uh, RPS was 120, total hemoglobin was 1.6, SGOT 48, SGPT 75, GGT was 102, and ALP of 61. In the protein, there were two plus protein, 15 to 17 RBCs, occasional granular cars. So we have a patient to redefine the syndrome, acute febrile illness, body pain, joint pain, uh, liver and spleen palpable, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, microscopic hematuria. Do our differentials change now? So we need tests. Uh, Postgraduates, anyone? Any blood tests? 
which you would like to ask for. A differential sitting you. Okay. Script type first. Okay. This patient was from Chennai. Um, malaria laptop. Okay. Let's proceed. Uh, dengue and scrub were negative, scrub IGM and dengue and this one was negative. Blood cultures were sterile. Uh, we, did a, we did a peripheral smear. So, this is what we found out. Postgraduates, uh, anything key on the smear. All these are real cases. So, this was a malaria case. Uh, So I will go to the my topic. This, this was a case of uh, it was a big forms of falciform. Uh, basically, we are in the zone of malaria transmission. First thing in every in, in, in country we divide it into malaria transmission zone, high, stable, and low. Currently, we belong to a malaria transmission zone. There are countries like Australia, Russia, other part of America where there is no malaria. My talk will be more uh, uh, corner towards WHO guidelines, which is recently been updated 2021. This is the life cycle, which most of us will be familiar with the life cycle, exometroid cycle, erythrocytic cycle. So, the, basically, the species of malaria are Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium boivax, Plasmodium ovale, and Plasmodium malaria. Are we missing anything? So, postgraduates, do you all agree? There are only four species, or do you think we need to add one more? So, as this plasmodium nolesi, this is the fifth species of malaria, which infects usually non human primates, but increasingly it has been reported in Southeast Asia and Western Pacific regions. How do we suspect malaria? In a malaria endemic area, malaria should be suspected in any patient presenting with history of fever or temperature more than 37.5 and no other obvious cause. In areas in where malaria transmission is stable or during high transmission period, malaria should also be suspected in children with palmar pallor or hemoglobin less than 8 gram. So the diagnosis is very key. The diagnosis is completely relies on parasitological diagnosis which should be ideally available less than two hours of the patient presenting to the OPD or which the patient is admitted. The tools we use was one is rapid diagnostic test, immunochromatography, microscopy, or MDQ PC can be used. The rapid diagnostic tests they detect parasite specific antigen or enzymes that are either genus or species specific. The run time is less than two hours which will help us in diagnosis. It does have limitations. For example, rapid diagnostic test for detecting uh, malaria, which commonly we used, is used for plasmodium falciparum, which uh, targeting the histidine rich protein. It can be useful for all patients in whom, uh, imagine the patient has been partially treated, in whom blood films can be negative. If initial blood film is negative, if manifestations are compatible with severe malaria, a series of blood films should be examined in an interval of 6 to 12 hours or we can even do RDT. But to remember, RDT may not detect vivax, ovale, malaria. It is useful for falciparum in our contest. There is uh, there's one notion of clinical malaria. Malaria is always has to have a clinical syndrome with parasitological diagnosis. According to WHO 2021, what they are telling is it always requires to diagnose malaria. If you are even suspecting malaria, you may have to do two RDTs minimum or a good peripheral smear in an interval of 6 to 12 hours to rule out malaria. Or if you are really suspecting malaria, rule out other causes of an acute febrile illness, which can be similar to malaria in clinical presentation. So the entity of clinical malaria, according to WHO, has a low grade recommendation. We need to establish a diagnosis of malaria first. So, RDT sensitivity wise is around 95% and specificity is 95.2%. But if you are doing an RDT targeting the LDH, 
the sensitivity is 93 and specificity goes up to 98.5. This is just a, a, a diagram representing how you do it. So you have a round hole, a buffer, that's a square hole, and then you can get the results. Uh, the ideal all these results should be available within less than two hours of the patient coming to the OPD or in patient. We can also depend if RID is negative, we can depend upon always the peripheral smear. Smear will always pick up the malaria parasite. So before we go to the treatment, it is very important to classify malaria. First thing, is it uncomplicated malaria or is it severe malaria? Because the treatment differs for both. First thing for severe malaria, any one of these components, if it is present, it is severe malaria. So if a patient has presented with clinical symptoms of malaria and you have established a diagnosis based on parasitological methods of malaria and has any one of the symptoms, we categorize it as a complicated or a severe malaria. That is impaired consciousness or in GCS2 less than 11. Prostration. So this sometimes can be reported as a subjective compla uh, complaint. But the exact definition of prostration is any patient who is unable to walk or stand on, on his own without support. If he's, if he's able to stand on his own and he requires support and he's extremely weak, it is termed as prostration. This can be at times mentioned subjective. More than two convulsions in 24 hours, acidosis, hypoglycemia. It's always very important to check sugars in a patient with severe malaria. Hypoglycemia is one of the components of severe malaria. Severe anemia, the cutoff according to WHO is hemoglobin less than 5 or if there is significant drop of hemoglobin. Renal impairment, creatinine worsening or the patient has hemoglobinuria is also one of the components of severe malaria. Progressive jaundice, not just jaundice, it is a progressive jaundice, bilirubin more than 3, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, significant bleeding, shock and hyperparasitemia. To note, the hyperparasitemia, the component may differ from patient population. If a person, is a traveler, comes from a non-endemic place, comes to an endemic country, and the parasitemia is if, if it is more than 4% also, it is very significant. However, if a person from an endemic place comes to another endemic place and then his parasitemia is more than 10, it is termed as hyperparasitemia. But any parasitemia more than 1% can be considered as a significant which requires aggressive monitoring. We we'll go to treatment of uncomplicated malaria first. So any patient who presents with symptoms of malaria and a positive parasitological test that is either a microscopy or an RDD with no features of severe malaria is defined as uncomplicated malaria. Always remember, human is defined as elimination of all parasites from the body. QBC is still showing features of plasmodium then we are not defined as cure. The continued use of artemisinin or any other partner medications alone will compromise the value of ACD, but there is chances of emerging drug resistance. So according to WHO, treating uncomplicated P. falciparum malaria, we can either use any of these components. However, in India, the most commonly used drug is artemether and dubifantrelin, artesunate amidopin, artesunate menfloquin, artesunate sulfatoxin and pyrimidamine. Artemether lumifantrin is an orally available ACT. To note, uncomplicated malaria, that is P. falciparum malaria, we should always treat with artemisinin combination therapy. The artemisinin component rapidly clears the parasites from the blood, reducing the parasitic numbers by a factor of approximately 10,000 in each 48 hour asexual cycle. And it is also active against the sexual stages of chemotocytes. The longer acting partner drug clears the remaining parasites and provides protection against the development of resistance. That's why ACT is always a multidimensional, it's always a combination based therapy. So, the duration in an uncomplicated falciparum malaria is a three day course of artemisinin component, which covers the two asexual cycles 
ensuring only small fraction remain for clearance by the other partner drug thus reducing the development of resistance so always it is artemisinin combination therapy which is a three day course the recommended dose of rt meter and nifantrelin which is given twice daily for three days that is total six doses the first two doses should ideally be given 8 ml apart this is the based on the body weight it is either for less than 15 it is 20 or 120 20 of rt meter and 120 of nifantrelin more than 35 this is the most commonly used 80 mg of rt meter and 480 of nifantrelin how about trimethyl can we give trimethyl for a patient with falciparum malaria the answer is yes according to who to reduce the transmissibility this is more of a community wise to reduce the community wise transmission it is advisable to give a single dose of trimethyl that is 0.25 mg per kg with act in patients with p falciparum except pregnant women infants less than 6 months and women breastfeeding less than 6 months to reduce it's basically for community level transmission and they have according to their recommendation you may not require for a single dose g6 pd testing for every patient what about first trimester pregnancy so patients who are pregnant in first trimester uh, the ideal drugs which are considered to be the safer ones are quinine chloroquine clindamycin and proguanin ACT that is artemisinin based combination therapy has a low graded recommendation in first trimester pregnancy however we have to consider it case to case basis so the safest drug for pregnancy will be quinine plus clindamycin that is 10 mg per kg for 7 days or quinine monotherapy if clindamycin is not available or we can even do ACT that is oral uh, artemisinin combination therapy but it is a low graded recommendation if we may have to choose it uh, case to case basis to so note this is only for first trimester we can use acp based therapy for second and trimester therapy what about uncomplicated vivax to cure the acute blood stage and to clear hypnocytes is the most important thing in uncomplicated vivax this clearing the hypnocytes from the liver is called radical cure So, for a chloroquine sensitive vivax malaria, oral chloroquine at a dose of 25 mg uh, base per kg is effective and well tolerated. To note about the dose, the dose is 10 mg per kg followed by 10 mg per kg in the second day, followed by 5 mg per kg on the third day. So, it is, it is not based on chloroquine. Initially, there was a term that you can try it, and after six hours, two hours. the current recommendation is the three doses day 1 day 2 and then day 3 another option for an uncomplicated vivax is rt penicillin uh, based combination therapy it's highly effective in treatment of vivax malaria especially in chloroquine resistant regions all malaria infection can also be treated with act but if we come from a reason for chloroquine is sensitive we can still give chloroquine in vivax What about oval malaria and pneumonia? So far, there are not well characterized resistance to oval malaria and pneumonia, and the infection caused by these three species generally considered sensitive to chloroquine. Trimethyl is the key for radical cure. To prevent relapse, treat plasmodium vivax or oval in children or adults without contraindications with a 14-day course of trimethyl in all transmission zone settings. 0.25 mg per kg this is vital another debate is is it why is it really required to do g6 pd testing before doing trimethyl for every patient so there was lot of uh, meta analysis on this whether g6 pd is mandatory according to who what they have suggested it is if feasible we can do g6 pd however if not feasible to do g6 pd deficiency from case to case basis based on the region the patient comes from we can take a call on giving trimethyl without doing g6 pd deficiency too if g6 pd deficiency is present we have to categorize the severity of g6 pd deficiency and then take a call on weekly trimethyl too 
What about severe malaria? So any patient who has the components listed in the previous slides belong to severe malaria. Two classes of medicines are available for parenteral treatment of severe malaria, artisunate or artimeter or quinine. So parenteral artisunate is the treatment of choice for all severe malaria. Dose of artisunate is 2.4 mg per kg per dose, 0, 12 hours and 24 hours. The next component is the most important in treatment of severe malaria. We need to assess the parasite density 4 hours after the last dose or at least after 24 hours. So if the parasite density is from 4% has fallen to less than 1%, we can transit to oral artemis name based therapy that is alhartimethyl lumifantrelin. However, if the parasite index is more than 1%, you continue IV. If it is persistently being more than 1%, you have to continue IV artesanate for another 6 days. That is, so then we may have to switch to oral artemisinin based combination therapy. So, this is according to WHO. If artesunate is not available, we can use artemether in preference to quinine for treating children. The artemether dose is 3.2 mg per kg intramuscularly to anterior thigh and maintenance dose is 1.6. We'll wind up with another case. 22 year old male from Chennai, no comorbidities, complaints of fever with chills for 10 days prior to admission, associated with generalized weakness, myalgia, the maximum temperature was 1 or 2 Fahrenheit was managed with paracetamol till the day of admission. So this is a 22 year old young male who presented with fever with chills for 10 days prior to admission. On examination, the GCS on admission was 15 by 15. The boy was literate, hemodynamic, he was stable, lungs were clear, there were no bleeding signs, no neck stiffness. The patient was admitted to the ward for persistent high grade fever and 8 hours into the admission, patient complained of giddiness and he had a decrease in GCS from 15 to 10 by 15. To know, he had travelled to Tanzania via Kenya on a family business trip. He stayed there for 2 weeks in Tanzania returned back to Chennai 10 days prior to admission. So this is the smear finding. Um, Postgraduates, any inputs? We are talking malaria, so this is definitely malaria. Any uh, differentials on the uh, species? On uh, the differential cerebral malaria, okay. Any, any, any note on species, what species this, this may belong to? The, the, the key differential is see the RBCs and then see the assets. So, so a case of falciparum malaria. And ubiquitous was positive with numerous ring forms of plasmodium falciparum. The parasite index, that is, we calculate the based on parasitemia, that is, parasitized RBCs. By total RBC into 100, it was 41.5, very high. VPG showed lactate of 7, pH was 7.317. He was started already on IV artisanate along with other supportive medications. Next day, we did a smear and we were calculating the parasite index. It was still 41. So there was no decrease. Day 3 again, it was still 41. So we have a patient with severe falciparum malaria with a travel history with a severe falciparum malaria with hyperparasitemia, elevated lactate, cerebral malaria. So, any changes in the treatment? Uh, it's open for uh, comments from all the participants. So, any change in the treatment we can think in this patient. Patient is already on IV artisanate. On the day 3, doxycycline has also been added. Artisanate and doxy is going on. Lact lactate is around 7. Day 3, the parasite index is still 41. 
So how can you share comments? Catherine program, okay. But the artisunate is a uh, uh, it's a standard therapy medication wise artisunate with doxycycline is going on. So can okay, with program. exchange transfusion. Sorry, exchange transfusion. Yes, yes, yes. I'll come for that. As as uh, Doctor Murlida sir told, we we really thought about exchange transfusion because this was the thrombocytopenia initially. Bilirubin was five. There was transaminases, there was hematuria, so almost had every component. The patient was shifted to ICU, developed respiratory distress, developed hypotension, he required oxygen support, he was on minimal, minimal noradrenaline. He was already on artisunate with doxycycline. So, in view of severe falciparum malaria with high parasitemia, after having a multidisciplinary discussion with intensive care, we planned a red cell exchange. Which was done on day with the uh, day one of the admission. Sorry, it's not day one. Day three of the admission with subsequent parasite index reduced to zero point two. So from forty one point five, we have a parasite index reduced to zero point two. And post red cell exchange, his GCS improved to fifteen by fifteen. From eleven, it improved to fifteen. Within twelve hours, he was off ionotropic support. He was off HFNC. He didn't require any ventilation. The plated improved to ninety thousand. Uh, Bilirubin also improved. Transaminases improved. So we had a case with severe Plasmodium falciparum malaria, causing cerebral malaria, distress, respiratory distress, hyperparasitemia of around forty-one percent, jaundice, hemoglobinuria, shock. Almost whatever components now explained in severe malaria, around five components this patient had, and he survived. He was treated with artisunia, artemisinin-based combination therapy, and red cell exchange. So, reading the literature, this is one of the article published in Clinical Infectious Diseases, where exchange transfusion as an adjuvant in severe Plasmodium falciparum malaria. It's a meta-analysis. We couldn't find any RCTs pertaining to it. So, although it does not appear the survival rate, however, it reduces the length of coma, duration of stay in intensive care unit, duration of fever in hospital, and onset or presence of residual complications. There were significant problems with the comparability of the treatment groups. So, they suggested RCT is necessary to determine whether exchange transfusion is beneficial. Uh, Fag end of my session. Any guess who is this eminent scientist? It is Donald Ross, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology of or uh, uh, Medicine nineteen zero two for his enormous work on malaria, by which he has shown it how it enters the organism. How it enters. Would like to end my session and be happy for questions also. Thank you for giving me an opportunity in this prestigious APA forum to uh, uh, give on diagnosis and management of malaria. Thank you, Dr. Vinay, for excellent presentation. Now the once the CLA is open for discussion. Uh, let us stay on mute and ask the questions. Thank you. We have uh, a couple of questions in the chat box. One question is uh, for Dr. Vinay. <coughs> so, um, the participant has asked whether uh, uh, checking for the parasite load is it necessary in all the cases or in specific cases that we take. And uh, like you said, one complicated case there was one uh, extreme one. In that case, is there any medical endpoint we need for taking uh, the cancer clearance again? Uh, the first question: uh, the necessity of checking parasite index in any patient who is presented with severe malaria or clinically you are suspecting severe malaria. 
it's a easy tool to check parasite index your based on your peripheral smear or uh, it's a easily calculatable index parasite index based on the peripheral smear through microscopy we can easily calculate the parasite index so to be very specified in resource limited setting uncomplicated malaria i agree it may not be possible to check however every case of severe malaria it is advisable according to who to check parasite index because the parasite index gives a clue for progression or regression of a disease too you are severe malaria you can plan your therapy based on parasite index the parasite index has fallen below 1% you can safely switch to oral artemisinin based combination therapy however if your parasite index is more than 1% persistently be more than 1% you need to complete your iv artesunate for total of 7 days before you switch to oral artemisinin based combination therapy second question regarding the exchange transmission so this patient we have been calculating the parasite index from the day 1 to day 3 and once the parasite index came below 1% it is almost given a thought that is clear there is another question for you in the chat box where they are asking about uh, situations and uh, uh, settings where they are working in resource limited settings and they are not able to uh, avail the facility of exchange transfusion for the patient so for such patients in this scenario is there anything else you can plan uh, in this scenario uh, for a resource limited setting we may have to continue with medical therapy and uh, supportive measures uh, Kapani sir, you have any other input, sir? This is what I can think of. Is that the problem here? Okay. Uh, uh, there, when I did my super specialty, they used to in the peripheral smear. Before we asked, they used to put the parasite index, and then we used to in the case per basis, we used to go and request them for a parasite index. So what I feel is case per basis, we can take a call in a patient who is progressing, who has features of severe malaria. We may have to use it as a tool. Because that may not require additional finances for it. Because you have a smear already, you just need to calculate the index, and this index will guide you in the therapy. So it is the best way to suggest the pathologist or whoever is doing the smear to guide in this therapy, telling the you know in your like educating them the importance in the medical therapy. There is another question regarding the uh, vaccine and treatment of malaria. Vaccine update. Uh, I'm not sure about it, sir. Recently, there was one vaccine which was approved. I think the details of that. I know there is a study going on, but I am it will be too immature to tell about the study unless before I read about it. I'm not sure about it. Uh, there is another question regarding the uh, treatment of resistant malaria. treatment of resistant malaria is a different component first thing uh, we need to establish the patient has comes from a zone where we have artemisinin based resistance the this reported resistance are from the belt of eastern india chatisgarh jharkhand there are reported resistance first we need to establish whether there is resistance or not then we can change on therapy the change on therapy can be quinine based or go for atovaquin proganil so this will be the two drugs atovaquin and proganil is a good drug but uh, and uh, procuring that drug is a big issue uh, there are only one pharmacy uh, company in india who is doing that so we may have to speak to them and get procuring that drug this one more question regarding the uh, steroid in case of hemolytic anemia no role there is uh, no role of steroids per se in any case of severe malaria unless the patient has any feature of hlh however we need to establish that so for even rcts also they couldn't find any role of steroids in a complicated severe malaria 
I think we need to consider it case to case basis, sir. Really and, but no, exceptional, case. exceptional cases, but the meta analysis wise, RCT, swire cities, there is no in meta analysis also they couldn't find any benefit with steroids. There are meta analysis on it, but they couldn't find any benefit per se. And the sample size was very small. So it may be the sample and size has to be two cases I've seen. Uh, another one of the key points to be noted is secondary infection. Especially in patients with HIV, uh, there are chances in a patient with malaria can have co-infection with Salmonella. So HIV patient who present with secondary infection is categorized as severe malaria. So they can have co-infection with Salmonella, especially post like HIV. Just one more question, sir. Kindly elaborate. Yeah. The red cell exchange, that is exchange transfusion, is mainly depending upon the viscosity. So whatever the parasitized RBCs are removed and fresh RBCs are transfused. So this is mainly for hyperparasitemia. But to note that whatever studies they have done, whatever the parasitized RBCs are present in the brain, it didn't make any benefit. They couldn't remove the parasitized RBCs from all the sources. Whatever is possible, the exchange removes it and supplements with fresh red cell. The uh, key add-on thing about red cell exchange is seeing the benefit in hours, in a matter of hours. So this is one, two cases we have seen. In this case, we had a very good benefit within 12 hours. And we, it's vital to check the parasitite in the index within 24 hours to see for the fall in parasitite index. If there is no fall, or if the fall is not achievable, we may have to repeat the red cell exchange. Uh, to note that we can't do red cell exchange in a patient with secondary infection. We can't do red cell exchange if a patient with severe malaria has a secondary infection. We should not do red cell exchange in that setting. One more question. What is the treatment of first time for pregnancy treatment of malaria? Yes, sir. first time is the treatment of uh, malaria. According to WHO 2021, they have suggested to go for chloroquine, quinine, atovoquine, proguanil. However, in case we are not able to procure, we may have to go for RTTMSN combination therapy. The grade of recommendation as they categorize high and low, the grade of recommendation is low for RTTMSN combination therapy. However, you can go ahead in second and third trimester with RTTMSN combination therapy. Uh, do you recommend the heat prophylaxis till delivery? Yes. Yes. The, uh, who has come from an uh, endemic zone, sir? Uh, treatment. After treatment. Okay. Yes. 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 There's a question for the uh, checkpoint, sir. Uh, as to uh, when the steroids have to be given in dengue and how much to give and for how long it has to be given. First of all, immediate for steroids in a uh, is uh, not evidence based. And even if you want to give it, it's only in the setting of uh, HLH, which can be diagnosed with the strict criteria. HLH and infection is a very uh, controversial thing because if uh, infection based HLH is entirely different from autoimmune based HLH or for that matter, malignancy based HLH. Steroids have been very strong in autoimmune based HLA, but not much of uh, steroids have been tried in infection based HLA because of the simple reason that it can worsen the existing infection. The treatment of HLA is uh, controlling underlying disease. So, in this case, since uh, we don't have any treatment for new uh, assets, uh, giving uh, steroid is justified if, if there is significant intermediary response. Now, all of the game is uh, not clear. Once then you solve it one gram, one dose, and found a good response. But having said that, it was only retrospective analysis, not a prospective analysis control trial. 
what is generally trying to work with the clinical practice which is not based on uh, evidence based data is that they for about 80 mg of protection which is about 2.5 cm this is for about 4 days that's a personal experience i won't say is a recommendation there is there is another question sir or uh, any uh, specific recommendations about treating dengue in pregnancy uh the dengue pregnancy does not have any separate uh, um, uh, pregnancy for treatment for the same time but there will be more complications in pregnancy so we have to be careful uh, those what will be introduced to the balance and uh, um, uh, also that uh, if we have a slightly higher threshold for pregnancy transmission as i have mentioned last night if the pregnancy comes as low in those type of high risk of bleeding it can give a prophylactic transmission at around 10000 to 20000 but otherwise uh, we don't give uh, prophylactic transmission so the difference is that closer monitoring of the fluids uh, uh, and uh, maybe it's like a higher threshold for uh, giving a uh, treated transfusion and the uh, first time is that could be possibility of a direct bleeding so they have to be careful with the first time is the uh, dengue This one, sir, dengue vaccine has always been a uh, controversy because of the possible of the complication of antibody and then the uh, pathogenesis. So, if there is uh, vaccination, uh, if there is immunity and uh, there is infection, uh, uh, another strain of dengue uh, is probably going to be more complicated. So, the uh, dengue vaccination is still not fully uh, evidence based. Uh, as per some uh, one uh, vaccine has been approved, but it has been given only after six antibody stages or this previous stage. Otherwise, when there is a second dengue attack, uh, that can be more complicated. So the short answer is that it is still not clear uh, regarding the safety of all the dengue vaccine. Although one vaccine has been recently uh, cleared for uh, use. Uh, so there is a question from Dr. Sadam Nai. Sir, could you please unmute and ask the question, sir, Dr. Salman Nai? Uh, Dr. Salman Nai asks: uh, Use of one or dose particles reduce overall debility, malaria, and dengue fever. Any comments? Sir? Use of one or dose particles. Right. Uh, Let's start with dengue. Particles uh, are only used in one or two doses. Is only uh, seen in our personal experience, but not known or not evidence based. So, if we have to uh, uh, extend the logic of uh, improvement of steroids, we can use uh, steroids. But then, do we have evidence for that? Uh, Studies which have done, uh, which have used steroids in the early days of the also did not find any overall benefit. So, the overall benefit is not there. And if there is high risk of complications of uh, secondary infections. Why we might more problem when you can manage it over there? So the uh, uh, easier way would be not to give steroid for a symptomatic bypass uh, of complication, but to wait for evidence of complication that will give uh, steroid. Otherwise, it will be uh, not be evidence based uh, practice. We can add on malaria uh, risk outweighs the benefit. That's the only thing I can tell. Giving a steroids risk outweighs the benefit. So overall, study per se, steroids in malaria studies per se has been very low compared to dengue. At least there is a studies being done being done in steroids in dengue. However, steroids in malaria, the studies per se it is sparse. Second thing, risk outweighs the benefit. Sir, as an extension of the same question, sometimes in the initial comparative case of dengue fever, we sometimes see that the uh, the response of the fever to paracetamol is not so good. So, in such situations, to uh, control the fever, can we use NSAIDs or steroids? NSAIDs can be used, but the steroids are, are not advisable because we don't have any evidence at all. So, uh, if paracetamol is not controlled uh, in full dose, then there is a, a role for adding uh, NSAIDs to control the fever. Then, when you are looking at this, in such cases, what are the steroids that you use? A new example is the infrared detection. So once they have got that that company expanded into the world, which goes beyond the conventional like infrared detection. Here the problem is again uh, because of direct CNN information or because of uh, uh, HLH uh, kind of cytokine uh, inflammation, which is damaging the brain. These small subsets of 
course, there is a role for uh, giving steroids because we see it as inflammatory or direct viral uh, involvement. And such small groups uh, of patients is highly important. There is a role for uh, giving a steroid as it would be any other viral encephalitis. So there's a question. We have seen many patients with a new high reaching only in the form and soul during the early recovery phase. This is a very common phenomenon. And uh, in fact, uh, when uh, uh, start, I usually when a patient goes on a bit recovery, that's what you see during recovery phase. So you can uh, itching of the uh, 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 soul and palm. It is a sign of a recovery phase, and then that's when the critical phase is slowly getting uh, to the recovery phase. And uh, the one other thing that we need to worry about is drug induced uh, uh, rash. That's one of the major different diagnoses at this point of time. The cause would be there is no scientific intent compared to my situation is that it is vascular that is the hallmark of danger. This is a capillary involvement, and uh, that's why there is a good place also. These things are seen in the state of awareness of capillary. That is the universal eye cause explanation for this interesting situation. One more question. Is there a rational in treating dengue fever cases with anti-malaria? Also, as both of them arise from mosquito bites. So, we've been using drugs for some of the patients that have been rationed ever since they are COVID-19. And the uh, drugs have been repurposed for uh, many other uh, exotic infections. With the good theoretical and scientific uh, argument, but then when it came to the question of proving it, all of them are very different, including if you remember the problem with hydroxychloroquine. Starting hydroxychloroquine is a sound clinical basis, and observation studies also show that it's beneficial, but we came to the question of randomness in the trial, it doesn't matter, there was no beneficial at all. Similarly, uh, in case of dengue, as of now, we don't have any confirmed uh, benefit of this medication. Although there are uh, discussions regarding possible role of uh, anti uh, inflammatory or inter-monitor like diet, uh, which is very high in Delhi, but not in, uh, uh, through the stage of uh, RCDs. We don't have any Thank you very much. One more question, sir. Why dengue vaccine not approved in India? As I already mentioned, the problem with dengue vaccine is uh, the uh, problem of uh, antibody enhanced uh, having which occurs in dengue fever. Uh, if you give a vaccine without checking the uh, uh, status of the individual, and once uh, there is vaccination, there is secondary dengue after a few years, there could be significant complications uh, uh, on severe dengue fever. This has been a problem in general uh, 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 world over. So maybe this small issue has been sorted out. One recommendation is to check the vaccination status or uh, admin status of the individual before giving vaccination. I think studies are going to clarify uh, uh, this issue. One more question, sir. Is there any reason because uh, sometimes diagnosis of malaria is difficult, at least to give empathic treatment? Sometimes uh, clinical based, sometimes some microbial government based. What do you say about this? Uh, in the era of uh, 2021, 2022, 2023, I strongly suggest whatever RDTs are available. So, for malaria, in resource limited settings also, we can do rapid diagnostic like card tests, history in which proteins, or a simple MPQDC. What I would suggest is if we are strongly suspecting malaria, Repeat the smear and MPQDC at least 6 to 12 hour period to establish the diagnosis. Second thing, rule out all the other causes of acute abdominal Still, you are suspecting a malaria, that is clinical malaria. According to WHO 2021, although the grade of recommendation is low, we can try anti malaria, but this is the grade is quite low. So, they, WHO clearly tells rule out all the causes of acute abdominal if we have done two RDDs and two smears, and those both are showing negative, and you have ruled out all other causes of acute separation in a resource limited setting where we will not be able to do further tests, we may have to do empiric testing, and it is case for case basis. Thank you.
There is no more for steroid and room shock syndrome. Um, having said that, you may be using you may use septic shock because treatment of septic shock does involve giving a lot of steroids. So, if there is a second infection, then uh, if there is a shock, there is a second infection, then you can use uh, uh, more treatment of steroids. But if it is only plain dengue and hemorrhagic uh, shock, then absolutely no room for steroids. The second Steroids use bradycardia. Uh, um, they use bradycardia is uh, innocuous and decay. You don't have to do uh, anything for that. And uh, I think also that those who have died had technically other than bradycardia. So it is a technical thing to worry about the non bradycardia. And generally, bradycardia patients uh, will use a technical bradycardia and do not have much of a problem in the So we have come to the end of the session. I'd like to propose the vote of thanks. Thank Lord Almighty for the success of our Mansur CME. Special thanks to the AMC Hospital, Medical Hospital Group, for all the digital support for the success of today's program. Thank Dr. B.H.K. Rauka for moderating the session. Sincere thanks to Dr. Chakravani sir. In spite of his busy schedule, he found time to take us from Arthur Satya to Kota Satya. Thank you, Dr. Vinay, for refreshing our memory. Post COVID, we have forgotten the treatment of malaria. Malaria is uh, fully questioning all our treatment options for malaria. Thank you, Roshan, sir, HOD, Department of Medicine. Thank you, Dr. Balachandra Shetty, sir, for moderating both the session. Thank you, Dr. Prabha Rikali, Madam, Dr. Madam, APN President and APA Secretary, for giving me a chance. And thanks one and all, especially we had 170 participants for today's session. And thanks for the interactive session, question and answer session. And uh, thank you one and all for today's program.